<laughs> Did you have any symptoms? Did you get both uh, doses? Yeah, yeah, I got both in uh, like February 26, March 26. The second one, I had some fever. Fever, yeah. Yeah, nothing much. But uh, I don't know if you met, there was a guy with Austro. Uh, he had some problem with his bones. He said he couldn't yeah. walk for a day. Yeah, I heard. I heard AstraZeneca, the, the, uh, it seems that the symptoms are more severe than the others. I heard that the second dose of both Pfizer and Moderna, they have like some symptoms, chilling and then, you know, bone pain and muscle pain and some of these, a fever even. Uh, so we'll see. I'm looking forward to the second dose. First dose was good. Okay. <laughs> So I, I have a back pain, so I may move a little bit uh, on my in my chair. I hope it doesn't bother you, but uh, we'll see how things go. I was trying to jump with my daughter, and I forgot that I'm not as young as she is. So maybe I get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we have Professor Mohsen Akbari uh, joining us for the Teresaki Talk series. He is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and the director of laboratory of innovations in microengineering at the University of Victoria. He has uh, obtained his PhD from Simon Fraser University and his postdoctoral training with uh, Dr. Kalem Hosseini at Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. He is re the recipient of many awards, including the Answer, Answer Postdoctoral Fellowship, BC Innovation Council Research Award, Kaiser Foundation Award, and is also recognized as a Canadian rising star in global health by grant challenges in Canada. He currently holds many uh, grants from CIHR, NSERC, CFI, BC Cancer Foundation, and the Department of National Defense. He's published over 85 journal papers and book chapters with the H index of 32 and with 4,500 4, citations. His work has been featured on the cover of 10 journals reported in media such as CBC News, Time Colonist, BBC News, Google News, Science Daily, Telegraph, and Fortune. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Akbari. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dokmechi, for your uh, great introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and present some of the work that we've been recently doing on, in the area of glioblastoma and a chip. I hear, uh, I see that and in the chat box, uh, uh, Venkata says that there is no voice. Can everyone hear me well? Are we good? All yeah, right. we can hear you. All yeah, right. We're good. Okay, all right. So let me just... Uh, 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 start with uh, where we are. Uh, so we live in the beautiful British Columbia uh, in an island on the Canada's southwestern coast. This is here and this is where my wife is. Uh, so we're very close to, uh, to Seattle, a 10 minutes flight from Seattle. And uh, our island is famous for its amazing hiking trails and beautiful gardens. The Butchard Garden is the famous garden in the British Columbia and maybe in, in Canada. And I usually uh, uh, go there with whenever we have a visitor. So I visited this garden more than 20 times in different seasons and it's always beautiful. Uh, Victoria is also the uh, capital of British Columbia, if, if you didn't know that. And then, then this is the government uh, building and we make all the decisions for British Columbians uh, here. So this is uh, 
uh, where we are. Uh, this is this is basically the the University of Victoria's campus. Uh, the majority of the buildings are in a ring road. Uh, so we are on the south side of the ring road. Uh, this is where I sit right now, engineering office wing, and my lab is here. And I usually walk through this bridge to go to my lab and then show myself to my student uh, 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 and then, uh, you know, talk about science and, and other stuff. So this is the team. Uh, we established, uh, my, established my lab in 2015 after I left Dr. Qadab Husseini's group. Uh, at Harvard. Uh, uh, so this photo was certainly taken before COVID when we were all smiling. You see, uh, we have uh, a number of students from, from different backgrounds and different, with different expertise, uh, from postdoc to undergrads. Uh, but one thing that you notice is that we see a little bit of uh, variation in, the, in, the, in, the, in their heights. But if you notice, the average height in my team is always my height because of course I'm the PI and I have to be the center of everything. So we lost uh, two of our tall members and we were looking for a, a, a few a new uh, members to join my group. So if you have expertise in tissue engineering and drug delivery and your height is around uh, 1.9 uh, meters, please contact me. Uh, so, uh, my lab is uh, doing a lot of work in the area of microfluidics and tissue engineering, but we have recently become interested in uh, glioblastoma. Uh, glioblastomas are uh, the most common and the most aggressive forms of primary brain tumors. They originate from the brain. Uh, and then although the number of patients with glioblastoma are not that high, the average survival time for these patients are quite uh, short. Uh, the uh, only 5% of patients survive more than five years and the average survival time is uh, something between 12 to 18 months. Uh, uh, one other feature of the glioblastomas is that they are uh, very diverse, which means that the, uh, the genetic profile of the tumors are different from patient to patient. At, but uh, another feature is that the, the, the genetic profile of uh, an individual patient also changes over time, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to treat. Also, glioblastomas are very uh, infiltrative. Uh, so what you can see is in this figure is that it, uh, we, uh, similar to many tumors, um, uh, glioblastomas have a tumor mass, but there are cells that have infiltrated into the uh, into the brain tissue uh, up to several centimeters away from the tumor mass, and then this makes this very uh, uh, detecting these. Uh, cells uh, using imaging techniques and also treating them uh, using uh, 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 existing therapeutics very, very difficult. So the current uh, uh, standard of care for treating glioblastoma, which was, you know, which hasn't changed that much since the 1970s, is a, a, a complete removal of the tumor uh, using surgery, if that's possible. Uh, and uh, followed by a, a course of radiotherapy and uh, chemotherapy. So a combination of radio and chemotherapy for six months and then followed by a, 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 a chemotherapy, a course of chemotherapy. So there are a number of challenges associated with, uh, with uh, managing glioblastoma. Uh, the first one is, is uh, surgery. There are challenges with surgery, uh, as, as uh, I mentioned, uh, we have a tumor mass. Uh, the tumor mass is located in, in the brain. Brain is, uh, is a very sensitive organ. It controls our emotions, our movements, our cognitive abilities. Uh, so uh, it's a very delicate tissue and then complete removal of the, um, the tumor mass and such a delicate tissue is, is uh, very complicated and very difficult. So 
uh, we usually uh, the surgeons remove the tumor to the extent that is possible, but there is always some cells uh, from the tumor mass that will be left at the at the site of the tumor. Besides, there are cells uh, that I showed you that have infiltrated uh, a few centimeters away from the tumor mass. And then these infiltrative cells cannot be detected by imaging techniques. Uh, and then also they cannot be removed using surgical approaches. So uh, radiotherapy is, um, of course, it's, uh, it, it has some, some benefits. However, uh, it's not effective in, um, in, in cells uh, that, are, uh, that are hypoxic. And also there are some limitations in terms of the penetration depth of the lethal doses of the radiation into the brain. In terms of drugs, there are a number of limitations. Uh, first of all, because of the presence of the blood-brain barrier, uh, we do not, uh, we have there are some limitations in terms of the uh, choice of drugs that can be used for treating uh, uh, glioblastoma. These drugs, they have to cross the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, our uh, uh, choice uh, of uh, drugs is very limited. Uh, also, we have limitations in terms of the diffusion of the drug into the brain. Again, remember there are cells who have penetrated a few centimeters uh, into the uh, into the brain, and then it's very difficult for the uh, for the drugs molecules to reach. Uh, to, for, for, it's very difficult to deliver lethal doses of the drug to uh, such distances from the from the brain tissue. And also there is. Uh, uh, from the from the tumor side, and also there is uh, an issue with of, of chemo resistance. Therefore, uh, there is a pressing need to develop new drugs, or a combination of drugs uh, that uh, can be used for treating glioblastoma. Uh, so the ultimate goal of any uh, chemotherapy or any treatment strategy that that we uh, would like to develop is to either uh, kill the cancer cells, or to, uh, to uh, uh, inhibit their uh, proliferation. So uh, my lab has been uh, interested in, in uh, uh, program cell death pathways. In particular, we are interested in apoptosis and, and autophagy. Uh, so apoptosis, uh, apoptosis is a type of program cell death, uh, which is defined as a highly regulated process of cell elimination. Uh, the key uh, events of apoptosis is our uh, cell shrinkage, nuclear and chromosomal uh, fragmentation, PARP cleavage, and so on and so forth. But apoptosis, the good thing about apoptosis is that it contains all the uh, uh, cellular components in, uh, in, uh, in particles or in vehicles uh, that uh, and do not uh, release pro-inflammatory signals that are typically released during necrosis. Uh, into the surrounding uh, tissue. These, these uh, pro-inflammatory signals or molecules can directly, uh, are not good for the, um, for the surrounding tissue because they can simulate, stimulate neighboring uh, viable cells to proliferate and uh, uh, therefore they can uh, increase the tumorogenesis. Uh, so uh, for that reason, apoptosis is, uh, is a desired mechanism of cell death. Uh, in any uh, therapy, uh, therapeutic drug that, uh, that we're developing. Another uh, pathway that we are interested in is autophagy. So autophagy is a Greek word that means self-eating. Uh, uh, autophagy is a process uh, that our body uses to recycle uh, damaged or old cell components. Uh, so it occurs as part of uh, a cell's everyday activities and uh, also as a response of uh, stresses that are uh, being uh, you know applied to the to the cells uh, so uh, during the process the damaged uh, organelles or uh, misfolded proteins are uh, collected in in these uh, hollow or double layer micro uh, spheres uh, which uh, we call them autophagosomes. And then later on, these autophagosomes are uh, uh, fused into uh, particles that are called lysosomes in which uh, then these micro, these, these cell components are uh, degraded. 
So uh, autophagy uh, can be triggered by uh, several factors, including starvation, hypoxia, and, and chemotherapeutic uh, drugs, depending on the type of the, uh, uh, the stimulation. Uh, the autophagy can lead to cell survival, or in severe situation, it can lead to, uh, to cell death. Uh, so it's very important for us to, uh, to uh, control or to modulate this pathway because autophagy can uh, act as a double-edged sword uh, in terms of uh, using chemotherapies. So it's, if, if, if uh, it, autophagy does not lead to cell death, then it may promote cell survival, which uh, is not something that is desired and can uh, result in increase uh, uh, in the tumor, cell tumor genesis. Uh, uh, for, the, for these key roles that autophagy pathway is playing in, in, uh, in, in cellular response to stresses and drugs, um, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, Professor Yoshinori uh, Usumi in, in 2016 for his studies on this, uh, this pathway. So, uh, so what we do here is, what we did here was that we, we used with a, a microfluidic uh, device, a multi-compartment microfluidic device to model the uh, glioblastoma uh, in, uh, on a chip. So this microfluidic device has a, a tumor compartment, which is connected to a stroma compartment. And these two uh, compartments were uh, uh, basically flanked with two uh, side channels that deliver nutrients and drugs to the, to the cells. So the idea here was to uh, investigate the effect of multiple drugs in, um, in, uh, uh, in vitro on the cellular behavior, on cell uh, death, and then also on, uh, on cellular invasion into the uh, stroma uh, layer. So we selected two drugs. The first one was timozolomide. So timozolomide is the drug that is currently being used for uh, treating glioblastoma. It causes DNA damage and apoptosis in MGMT methylated glioma cells. Uh, however, the challenge with timozolomide is, is that it has no effect on unmethylated glioma cells, which uh, 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 is uh, uh, which uh, in which many patients actually uh, have these cells. And also, uh, it uh, develops chemoresistance pretty quickly in, in, the, in, uh, in patients. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we decided to use another drug, which is uh, called simvastatin. So simvastatin is uh, in the family of statins, uh, which are FDA-approved drugs that are widely used uh, for reducing the cholesterol level in the, in the blood. Uh, simvastatin is an interesting drug because uh, it's uh, um, lipophilic, so it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It has also been shown that uh, simvastatin has less toxicity uh, in, the, in the liver and gastrointestinal tract as compared to other types of statins. Uh, a number of uh, clinical studies, uh, recent clinical studies actually have shown that long-term consumption of statins prior on in parallel uh, with anti-cancer drugs have increased the survival rate of patients uh, in various forms of cancer. And then we wanted to uh, investigate the effect of um, uh, using uh, simvastatin in combination with timozolomide uh, on, to see whether the drug, uh, whether the uh, clinical or whether the uh, toxicity of timozolomide can, uh, can be enhanced. Uh, so we treated the cells that were grown in the, in the microfluidic device that I showed you with this. Uh, with these drugs, we first treated them with timozolomide uh, and uh, simvastatin, both of them alone. And then we looked at the, uh, uh, the immunofluorescent images and in particular the uh, autophagy pathway. Uh, so what we noticed was that these drugs first have different effects on the autophagy uh, pathway. Uh, so when we compared the uh, the timozolomide treated drugs with uh, with control uh, treated cells with the control cells, uh, uh, we noticed that the 
timozolamide induced autophagy in the cells uh, as confirmed by the co-localization of uh, LC3B uh, beta punctua, which uh, confirmed the autophagosome formation and, uh, and P62. Here, these arrows, which confirm the, uh, the fusion uh, of autophagosomes and, and lysosomes. So this confirms that the autophagy, autophagy pathway has been um, activated in, the, in these cells, whereas uh, in uh, the cells that were treated with simvastatin, uh, we did not observe uh, such behaviors in the cells. We noticed that the uh, LC3 beta uh, 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 punctua were formed. However, there was no uh, co-localizations. Uh, uh, so uh, that, with that, we con concluded that the simvastatin did not induce autophagy. However, timozolomide induced uh, autophagy in our uh, in, in, in the glima cell line. So uh, then we wanted to understand if uh, autophagy is the mechanism that causes cell death uh, in, in glioma cells. Uh, so to do that, uh, what we did was that we knocked down one of the uh, autophagy genes uh, in, in the cells, and then we compared the cellular viability uh, when they were treated with timozolomide and simvastatin uh, in, uh, uh, as co and compared the results with, with the scrambled uh, or, uh, cells. Uh, so as you can see uh, in the results, in the majority of the conditions that we use, autophagy had a minor effect on the induction of apoptosis in uh, glioblastoma uh, cells that were both treated uh, with, with either simvastatin or timozolomide. Uh, from these results, we concluded that uh, autophagy is not connected to uh, to apoptosis, and it's a parallel mechanism to apoptosis in our model. We also uh, studied the effect of uh, uh, different drugs on, on uh, uh, the, the drug concentration and different drugs on the uh, cellular invasion. Uh, so uh, an invasiveness of the cells. So we looked at the, uh, we treated the uh, the cells with, with different concentrations of uh, timozolomide and then also simvastatin alone. And then we uh, took uh, uh, confocal images of the, uh, the cells that were uh, invaded in the stroma layer. Uh, when we looked at this, we noticed that as the concentration of the drugs increased uh, in both drugs, timozolomide and simvastatin, uh, the number of invaded cells and also the, uh, the invasion front uh, was significantly uh, reduced. And uh, this re reduction in the uh, cell invasion uh, and the number of cells was uh, dose dependent. However, the, uh, uh, this observation could be as a result of cell death and then all, or reduction in the cellular in the invasiveness of the cells. So uh, to look at the cells and then to, uh, to, to test the, uh, whether the drug has uh, effect on the invasiveness of the, invasiveness of the cells, we, uh, we uh, stain the cells uh, against uh, vimentin, which is a marker uh, for invasive, uh, invasiveness of the cells. And then we noticed that the cells that were treated with uh, timozolomide and simvastatin, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, vimentin, expressed vimentin in the cells were significantly lower than the uh, control cells which confirms that uh, not only the drugs had effect on the cellular viability, but they also reduced the invasiveness of these, uh, these cells. So now that we, uh, we investigated the effect of uh, each of these drugs on, on the cells, we looked at the uh, effect of combination of these drugs on the cells. So we treated the uh, drugs with each of, uh, with individual cells and then a combination of individual drugs and then a combination of simvastatin and timozolomide. Uh, in this figure, uh, um, as you can see in the cell lines that we use, uh, although each of the drugs induce toxicity and um, reduce the cellular viability, however, there is a significant reduction in the uh, 
uh, in the cellular viability when a combination of drugs was used. And we even confirmed this in uh, a patient-drive cell line. Uh, uh, and uh, we showed that uh, a combination, that addition of simvastatin to the uh, to timozolomide increased the sensitivity of the cells to timozolomide. So that's uh, these are encouraging results. Of course, we need to confirm these results in uh, more cell lines, and then we need to also understand the mechanism uh, that is uh, uh, involved in this. Uh, sensitivity, chemosensitivity. So uh, later we decided to further complicate the, uh, the model. The reason for that was because uh, we would like, we wanted to first uh, 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 provide a better model that mimics the uh, the cell cell interactions in the tumor and the diffusion of the drugs and nutrients within the tumor, and then also model the uh, hypoxic uh, and necrotic cores that are typically observed in uh, in large uh, tumors. So uh, to do that, we uh, uh, we uh, modified the microfluidic device, and then we created a tumor storage using our self-filling microwell array platform, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then we uh, encapsulated these uh, uh, tumoroids with uh, with neurons and uh, in the microfluidic device. Uh, so. Uh, the self-filling microwell array platform that we developed uses uh, 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 uses 3D printing to create a mold and then rep replicates the mold into um, into uh, any uh, uh, hydrogel or any other polymers uh, for that can be used for for uh, for making spheroids. Uh, the good thing about this uh, 3D printing method uh, uh, is that it enables us to uh, create uh, micro wells with really, uh, really uh, uh, weird shapes, such as the ones that you can see here, but it also uh, eliminates the need uh, for you uh, uh, to use clean room facility. It also, uh, it is also a fast approach to, uh, to create uh, prototypes. And then also uh, it enables us to, to make many of these molds uh, for, um, uh, for making a, a large number of cells and, and tumors. Also, uh, it enables us to create non-planar and complex structures, as I mentioned. And then this uh, ability to create non-planar uh, features has uh, led us to create these self-filling microwell arrays, which are formed from a seeding uh, cell chamber, uh, which are connected to, uh, to the micro microwells via uh, an inclined chamber. So, and the reason for designing these inclined chambers in the uh, in the microwell array is uh, because we wanted to be able to use the gravitational force to to distribute the cells in each of these uh, microwells. So, uh, what you see here is a microwell that was uh, created to fit in uh, in a six well in a in a twelve well plate, uh, and then you see that the loading chamber is connected to uh, to these little micro channels, which we can control their size, and and then by loading the cells at this chamber, the cells will be distributed evenly into each of these um, these. Um, uh, micro walls. And then with that, we were able to uh, obtain spheroids with uniform size distribution. And also uh, we could do that with in a one step and rapid rapid uh, seeding approach. And if you have worked with micro well arrays before, you, you, you would uh, probably appreciate the uh, advantages that this, uh, uh, this technology uh, offers for uh, uh, creating tumors in the uh, uh, in microwell array platform. So we use this uh, system uh, to create uh, uh, tumoroids made out of uh, breast cancer cells, uh, glioma cells, and then uh, a number of other cells, patient drive cells, and then uh, pancreatic and ovarian cancer cells, which I'm not showing the results here, but this results here that I show uh, 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 displays the uh, uh, 
uh, these uh, uh, tumors that we made, and then we treated them. We use these tumors later on uh, to investigate the um, uh, cytotoxic effect of uh, doxorubicin in this case, which is an anti-cancer drug on these cells. So, so uh, we uh, we sh showcase the ability of using uh, the the ability of using these uh, tumors for anti-cancer drug screening. Uh, we were able to quantify the um, inhibition concentration of the drugs, uh, different concentrations, and then we, we compared the results to, uh, to the cells that were grown on monolayers. Uh, of course, uh, as most of you may know, uh, the cells, uh, because of the diffusion barriers that tumors uh, 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 develop against the drug, uh, then this, uh, uh, the, the spheroids, the cells in the tumors are less sensitive to the cells that are cultured in monolayers. And they, uh, many studies have shown that tumors are uh, better uh, models for uh, uh, drug screening applications and then also for uh, 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 inhibition concentration uh, uh, studies. So, uh, so we created these spheroids. Then uh, we also uh, uh, created the new uh, matrix uh, that is a combination of uh, a number of hydrogels, including hyaluronic acid, matrigel, and, and a number of other components. Which, uh, since we haven't published this, uh, 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 maybe maybe we can uh, we can share the result, the the, the composition later. However, uh, the composition mimics the extracellular matrix of the brain uh, much better. Uh, so uh, mostly, uh, most researchers, they use collagen as an extracellular matrix, but, but uh, 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 in our study, we try to include uh, the majority of the components that are present in the extracellular matrix of the brain. And then we grew uh, different types of cells, including the uh, glioma cells and stem cell derived neurons in these uh, gels and then uh, uh, showed that the cell uh, we could achieve high cell viabilities in this um, in these basically matrices uh, this matrix and then also uh, uh, we noticed that uh, the uh, uh, for the neurons uh, the neurons maintain their uh, 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 basically phenotype uh, by expressing neuron specific uh, markers in these uh, in this uh, uh, Hydrogels. We also uh, developed a chemo resistant uh, 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 cell line. Uh, it took us um, almost a year to develop this cell line. Uh, however, this cell line is uh, highly resistant to uh, timozolomide, up to almost six folds more resistant to timozolomide. Uh, and then uh, we showed that these uh, cells. Uh, are uh, when they form spheroids, they don't even die at uh, concentrate at very high concentrations of uh, the uh, timozolomide, which is uh, 5,000 micromolar, which is extremely high, uh, as compared to when we the cells are uh, as compared to non uh, chemo resistant version, which are uh, uh, which which uh, has the IC50 of uh, around 100 micro. Uh, micromolar when they're grown in 2D. And then we showed that we can successfully uh, grow these uh, tumoroids in, in, the, in the matrix that I showed you alone, and also uh, co-culture with the neurons. And then we noticed that these uh, cells, they uh, start spreading in, a, in, in three dimension, uh, and then they follow these uh, finger-like invasion patterns that you typically observe uh, in uh, glioblastoma tumors. Uh, so now that we had these uh, timozolomide resistant cells uh, uh, in hand, so we wanted to uh, better characterize these cells. So uh, we took uh, transmission electron microscopy TEM images uh, of these cells, and uh, the results confirmed uh, that uh, uh, that the, uh, the number of uh, vesicles 
uh, as you can see here in this Timogelomod resistant TMM images, the number of vesicles has significantly increased as compared to the non-resistant cells. So these are uh, basically, uh, these vesicles show the formation of uh, double membrane vesicles uh, as a result of uh, autophagosome uh, formation. Uh, also, uh, uh, when we looked at these uh, with closer look at these TEM, TEM images, we noticed that even the mitochondria uh, uh, was changed. Uh, the structure of the mitochondria was uh, significantly different in, in timozolomide resistances as compared to, uh, to non-resistant cells, uh, uh, which uh, shows that uh, the changes have been, uh, the mitochondria have been significantly affected by uh, and, uh, by the resistance of the cells to the uh, to the timozolomide, so they are totally different uh, cells, and then therefore they will uh, 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 they will respond differently uh, to different uh, treatments uh, of the of different uh, uh, basically treatment strategies. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to know if uh, how the metabolism of the cells have been uh, affected. Uh, when they become more uh, uh, resistant. Uh, I'm, I'm not showing some of the proteomic and uh, cytokine analysis results that we've obtained recently, uh, but uh, just briefly, uh, we looked at the cholesterol pathway. Again, keep in mind that we were interested in using simvastatin, which is a, a cholesterol lowering uh, drug. And then for that reason, we looked at the amount of uh, cholesterol that was uh, produced by these uh, chemoresistant cells in the media. And then we noticed that the, uh, there is a significant decrease in the total cholesterol uh, uh, that was produced by these uh, uh, basically timozolomide resistant cells at all time points, at different time points, 24 hours, 48 hours, and, and 74 hours. And then even de novo cholesterol biosynthesis was significantly uh, reduced in uh, in uh, in chemoresistant cells. So there is something going on. Uh, we still do not know uh, exactly uh, what's what's happening there, but uh, uh, but uh, it clearly seems that the cholesterol pathway is has been affected and uh, or has been uh, changed in 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 the cells that are timozolomide resistant and maybe uh, using cholesterol lowering drugs uh, 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 such as uh, statins can affect uh, this, uh, the survival of these cells and, and maybe can be used as a therapeutic drug in combination with timozolomide to eradicate these cells. But again, there is, this is an ongoing research uh, with one of my great collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Kawami, uh, uh, and then uh, hopefully soon we will be able to publish the results. So uh, now let me just shift gears uh, for the next few minutes. And uh, uh, so I think I have another 10 minutes uh, and then talk about uh, some of the work that we are doing in terms of integrating mathematical modeling uh, with, uh, with our in vitro model. I don't think I need to lecture this graph to, uh, to this group, uh, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with the drug development process, which involves uh, uh, the drug in vitro drug discovery, followed by in vivo preclinical uh, studies and clinical trials. Uh, uh, you, I'm sure you know this is a very long uh, process and it's a very expensive process. And we think that maybe for us, uh, by combining a mathematical modeling uh, that helps us to uh, understand the tumor uh, formation, tumor growth, and also response of tumors to different drugs, we may be able to, uh, first of all, uh, screen the drugs in a much cheaper and faster way uh, at the drug discovery stage. And also, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe by understanding the uh, uh, drug pharmac pharmacokinetics uh, using the mathematical modeling, and, uh, 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 and uh, we may be able to reduce also the number of animals that are used uh, in vivo to uh, uh, basically uh, to, uh, uh, for preclinical studies. So with that in mind, uh, we uh, uh, have started a, a, a new research area in my lab that is focuses 
on developing a mathematical model uh, for uh, uh, that that uh, predicts tumor formation and uh, tumor uh, uh, growth and tumor invasion. Uh, so at the first stage, uh, uh, the uh, the evolution of tumor usually starts with with the formation of aggregation of uh, uh, cancerous cells and then their growth, volumetric growth, uh, where the size of the tumor uh, increases dramatically. Uh, and uh, uh, however, the size is small enough that uh, the cells that are at the core of the tumor receive enough uh, nutrients and oxygen and, and, and they don't uh, uh, die. But as soon as the size of the tumor reaches to a certain point, then uh, we start forming uh, gradients of uh, molecules and oxygens within these uh, within the tumor, which causes uh, which leads to the formation of a hypoxic and eventually necrotic core. And when the tumor grows further, then you will see that we will form this multi-layer uh, of cells, uh, including a necrotic core, the quiescent uh, viable um, zone, and uh, the proliferation zone. And then at some point, the rate of uh, the number of proliferative cells and the number of necrotic cells will balance and then the tumor does not grow anymore. And then it starts uh, invading uh, into the neighboring tissue uh, to, uh, uh, towards mostly the, uh, uh, the blood vessels. And then also they trigger uh, 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 angiogenesis and uh, uh, sprouting angiogenesis and formation of new blood vessels uh, to obtain more nutrients from um, uh, for the cells that are in the tumor. So our goal here is to uh, to model first this stage, the tumor formation, the tumor growth, and at the later stage, the uh, tumor invasion and, and uh, angiogenesis. So uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, we started with the with the first stage, which is the tumor formation. Uh, so in the tumor formation stage, uh, we started with a, a diffusion, a convective diffusion uh, model. It's a, it's a continuum model. The entire body of the uh, the tumoroid is considered as a single continuum uh, uh, system. And then we uh, consider the diffusion of uh, uh, nutrients and oxygen in within this continuum environment and also uh, the uh, the growth of the cell as as uh, uh, as a uh, basically uh, uh, predicted the growth of the cells using these uh, uh, these mathematical models I, I don't I didn't bring all these uh, big equations uh, in the, um, here. Uh, however, one interesting thing that uh, we uh, noticed in this model was that um, uh, that when the tumor is is being formed during the uh, the, the first initial aggregation of the cells, uh, uh, we noticed that in in both mathematical models and then also in our uh, experimental data, we noticed that the cells start. Uh, attracting, uh, generating adhesion forces. Uh, and then because of these adhesion forces, they pull each other together. And then the tumor size uh, during the first few hours uh, uh, shrinks instead of increasing. And then after some time, when uh, the cells start to uh, proliferate, then the size of the tumor uh, grows. And then both mathematical model and experimental data, they confirm this behavior. And then, uh, as you can see here, the mathematical model that we developed uh, nicely uh, uh, predicted this uh, initial tumor shrinkage and uh, subsequent tumor growth in, in two cell lines. Again, uh, these are, uh, we use uh, cell lines here. Uh, and indeed, we need to further verify this model using uh, 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 patient drive cells, and then also tumoroids that have, uh, that are formed from uh, 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 heterogeneous uh, uh, cell populations. Uh, so after the first phase of the growth, then as I mentioned, then we'll go to, a, a, to, to an invasion stage where the cells start uh, migrating towards, uh, towards uh, blood vessels mostly. Uh, so we identified different types of uh, uh, invasions. 
we have finger-like uh, finger type invasion in which uh, uh, the cells start uh, invading uh, individually and sprouting like like a, like sprouts into into the neighboring tissue. They usually move really fast into the uh, into the neighboring tissue. Uh, we have an elastic deformation, uh, which basically have uh, uh, basically the tumor. Uh, uh, starts to deform, and this this deformation is usually uh, towards the gradient of nutrients or molecules that are present in the uh, in the uh, in the tumor microenvironment. And then we recently noticed that some of the cells that we grew in uh, in uh, in our microwell array they followed a ring type invasion. And after we uh, we um, talk to our clinical collaborator, uh, they also mentioned that the, uh, this can be uh, a case in some of the cells in which they, uh, especially when there is, uh, you know, in certain types of cells, especially when um, there is a significant lack of nutrients, then the cells start uh, to uh, travel collectively and detach from the body of the, uh, the, um, the uh, tumor mass towards the uh, towards the uh, 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 nutrient uh, source. Uh, again, we we uh, in uh, to model each of these invasion modes, uh, we combine this continuum model that I talked about with uh, a, a discrete model that focuses only on individual cells uh, and monitors the movement of uh, individual cells within the tissue. Uh, we consider the effect of the matrix on the tumor invasion. And then we were able to model the finger type invasion, the inelastic invasion and the defo uh, formation of the tumor. And then we are currently working on modeling the ring type invasion. And then we would like to understand the different conditions and the mechanisms that are behind the, uh, these different type, type of uh, types of invasion. And of course we need to uh, uh, talk to many biologists and understand uh, again, I mean these these uh, uh, mechanisms that are involved. So, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, for now end my uh, my talk uh, and summarize uh, this this presentation. Of course, there is a pressing need to develop new drugs or a combination of drugs uh, that can be used to treat glioblastoma. Glioblastoma. Uh, there are only a handful of drugs that are available in the market, uh, and timozolomide is is uh, just one drug that has been widely used. There are other drugs, anti-angiogenic uh, drugs such as bevacizumab uh, and, and or avastin, and then, then other types of drugs are currently in a clinical trial or they have obtained. Uh, 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 FDA approval, but they are not very effective in terms of treating glioblastoma. Uh, we need to develop better uh, models that can uh, mimic the complexities of the brain tumor. There are many groups working in this area. There's many advances uh, that have been made in this area. Very cool studies uh, uh, recently uh, developed and published in this area. And then uh, uh, hopefully these, these more realistic models can be used to uh, develop and to, to study uh, the effect of different drugs uh, and the, um, and, uh, on the cells. And then hopefully they can be used to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to test these drugs and then uh, finally uh, develop drugs that are safe and then effective. Uh, we think that a combination of mathematical and experimental uh, models can be a, a very effective way to uh, to uh, increase the speed of the, the drug development process uh, and also reduce the cost and also uh, reduce the number of uh, animals that can be that needs to be used for uh, uh, um, testing the efficacy and then also testing the biocompatibility of these uh, these drugs. However, uh, all these models, including the models that uh, the model that we have developed, they require rigorous validation. Uh, especially, uh, we need to use patient-derived cells, and then they have to be validated against uh, against uh, animal results, and then also human uh, patient-derived uh, tissues uh, before they can be uh, fully exploited for the drug uh, screening process. So with that, I'd like to thank a, a, a number of people here. This is uh, Brian Toyota. He's a neurosurgeon who, uh, 
who cuts brain tumors using laser. He is a fantastic uh, collaborator. And then he is always uh, criticizing me uh, uh, sometimes about some of the crazy ideas that I have. Uh, this is Said, uh, my great friend, and then a fantastic collaborator. Uh, and then he has this big mustache. And then, uh, but uh, I mean, I mean, he's he's fantastic. He's, he knows biology a lot, and and helps us uh, plenty with this, uh, with uh, with better understanding of the uh, the biology behind the invasion of this uh, glioblastoma. And then he's an expert in autophagy. Uh, this is Ben. Uh, he's my colleague at University of Victoria. Uh, he works with uh, with a lot of uh, numerical, uh, you know, uh, equations, and uh, and then he sometimes shows me these big equations, which uh, I think he tries to uh, to confuse me. But anyways, that's uh, uh, he's a, a collaborator that helps us with the, with the mathematical model development. Uh, of course, uh, I'm the face of the team. Uh, these are the folks who were behind the scene and then work really hard to make this happen. Specifically, I'd like to uh, to appreciate Ehsan's uh, effort and Shahla's effort on this and this project, and then also Bahram, who we used to like, but now we don't like him because he left my lab. And then Amir, who spent a lot of time on on developing the uh, in vitro model, and Maytham, who is working on the, developing this. Uh, Basically, mathematical model. He's uh, he he's the brain behind all these equations. And Ray Hane, who uh, who developed and tested some of the drugs in our microfluidic device. And last but not least, I would like to thank all the funding agencies who supported this uh, these projects. Uh, my last slide is uh, about the e-seminar series that we've uh, we're, I'm organizing with my great collaborator, Professor Salvaji from University of Montreal. Uh, so we uh, we have a, a hot summer with great speakers lined up for this e-seminar series. Uh, please feel free. Uh, please make sure that you follow us on our uh, Twitter account. Uh, we have been uh, um, we have so far 1,200 registrants. So far, invited 44 speakers, and then we have had 10,000 YouTube views uh, so far. So it's uh, uh, it has been well received. Please feel free to. Uh, to, uh, to join us and visit us and uh, uh, also nominate speakers uh, that you think are, uh, uh, are good for this, uh, for this event. With that, I'd like to thank you for, uh, thank first of all, uh, the Terasaki Institute uh, for inviting me to, uh, to give a talk. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the audience for uh, taking their time and listening to, to my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, this is my email, and then this is my website. And, uh, uh, and, and with that, I'd like to end my, uh, my talk, and then I'm happy to take a, a, a few questions. Uh, great talk, Monsen. We get the, the record number of questions. So how do you account for the BVB in your glioblastoma on a chip model? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good and tough question. So the blood-brain barrier, we haven't accounted for it yet. Uh, the, the channels are there, but we haven't formed the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so that's one of the uh, uh, next steps that we're, we're trying to achieve. What is the mechanism on how statins can augment anti-cancer effects of other treatments? Uh, so again, a very good question. That's something that we are trying to understand. Uh, we are doing a lot of uh, proteomics and uh, uh, you know metabolomic studies to understand uh, if, uh, how uh, uh, cholesterol will affect the uh, you know uh, the will send how cholesterol uh, or statins they. Uh, uh, sensitize the cells to timozoloma. That's something that we do not know, but we observed uh, this. Uh, we chose statins in, uh, because, because they have shown uh, some promising results in, in uh, clinical studies in other cancers. Does the presence of inflammatory cells change the results obtained in your study? Yes, it does. And then we need to include them in our model. So uh, again, another next next step is to uh, create uh, immunocompetent uh, model with with, uh, with uh, resident macrophages or macroglias, and then also uh, you know circulating uh, T cells. 
but that certainly will have because it's a it's a it's a combination it's a mix of different cells and then they're they're uh, interacting with each other and then they're releasing so many different kinds of factors in the environment so the tumor envi macro environment the, the closer we get to the to the complexity of the tumor macro environment in the brain tumor uh, will be uh, you know again uh, more accurate the results will be I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Uh, did you measure IC50? We measured IC50 uh, in some of our experiments, yes. Can this platform be used for medium high throughput drug screening? This model? Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, at least the challenge we had uh, with, uh, with this microfluidic systems is that it's very difficult to work with, with them in terms of, because the majority of the uh, steps that we take to culture cells, to inject the cells, to mix the cells with the gel, and, and, then, uh, and then other steps, uh, they're pretty time consuming. And then uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to use them, in my opinion. Again, uh, this is my humble opinion that this is, this is uh, not going to be easy to use for high throughput uh, drug screening. Uh, unless we can integrate it in the automated, uh, you know, liquid handling systems. Uh, however, uh, my lab is working on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, modifying this technology in a way that we can uh, combine microfluidics with, with 3D printing and 3D bioprinting to improve the throughput of the, uh, the, the studies. However, again, I mean, that's something that is ongoing. Wish us luck. Thanks. Good luck. The TMZ dose for autophagy is relatively high. To what extent do you think that autophagy induced with 250 micromolar is secondary to apoptosis induction? Or do you think autophagy is induced with lower doses? Uh, that's again, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, and then we, we for, in this study, we wanted to, and you're right, we wanted to go with the dose that uh, can certainly uh, induce autophagy, and then we wanted to see if this is uh, this is happening. However, we need to do a dose-dependent study and then uh, investigate the effect of different doses of timozolomide on the activation of autophagy pathway. Uh, but that's an that's an excellent question. What is the cell line used for establishing the TMZ R cell line? Does it have an inherent methylate, a methylated MGMT? Do you yes, think there yes. can be a link between MGMT expression and statin response? Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so these are uh, uh, basically the cells that we use to uh, to develop the uh, uh, to develop the uh, uh, the timozolomide resistant uh, uh, sorry, uh, cells were uh, basically uh, methylated cells, and then. Uh, uh, and, but yes, uh, the, uh, one of the studies that we are doing right now is that we're using this chemo resistance, uh, timozolomide resistance cells to investigate the effect of uh, statins uh, on the sensitivity of these cells uh, to study whether statins can improve the sensitivity of timozolomide resistance cells to, uh, to drugs, to, to timozolomide. In your opinion, in these systems, is designing specific microchannel more effective in treating cancer or optimizing raw materials such as using different carriers, lipid, hydrogel, polymer? Uh, can you repeat the question again? I'm not quite sure if I understood it. Sure. In these systems, is designing a specific microchannel more effective in treating cancer or optimizing raw materials such as using different carriers, lipid, hydrogel, polymer? So uh, I'll try to answer this question uh, as, 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 as much as possible. Again, um, I mean, the, the design of these micro channels, there are many, many different aspects uh, that are involved in the design. And I just wanted to clarify that this is not our design. This is uh, uh, Professor Roger Cam's design, right? I mean, I mean, and we are just simply using their design uh, to, uh, to study program cell depth. And then when uh, in this design, what they did was, uh, what we did and they did actually, uh, was, was that they, uh, they 
chose these uh, spacing between the uh, the posts. So we have these little posts in, in the micro channels, which separate the tumor channel and the gel channel from the side channels uh, that deliver nutrients. And then uh, the, the distance between these posts, the shape of these posts, they're all optimized to make sure that the gel does not you know, diffuse into the side channels during the cell injection process. Uh, of course, uh, there are some design considerations in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the height, the width um, of these uh, micro channels to make sure that the cells do not come out of these uh, uh, gel component, uh, the, 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 uh, the tumor component. And also uh, in, in future cases, when we want to investigate the, uh, to form the blood brain barrier, uh, these channels can certainly help. Uh, the other, uh, the design of this channel can certainly help or may change. And then the other thing, the other factor might be uh, that may affect the results is, is the, the, the design of the channels is uh, if you want to use these systems for uh, investigating, uh, you know, the diffusion or penetration of nanoparticles into the, into the tissue, which in which we need to still uh, think about changing the design. I don't know if I answered your question properly, uh, but uh, I did my best. I was pretty solid. Uh, looks like you got good synergistic effects. Did you test these drugs in animal models? Uh, we have tested this and I, I, I didn't uh, hit it. Uh, and uh, Syed has done this and then um, uh, we, we are planning to publish the results pretty soon. Did you, um, did you check this with glioblastoma cancer stem cells? Which ones? Uh, so, uh, oops. Uh, so we tested. So these timozolomites uh, resistant cells, cells are uh, stem cells, right? I mean, because because those cells, uh, these are the cells that survived, and then uh, uh, so we we tested them with with these cells with the timozolomite resistant cells. However, uh, stem cells that are collected from patients, uh, no, we haven't uh, we haven't tested. Them. Um, is there any interaction between drugs? That's a very good question. Timozolomide and uh, well, I mean, uh, this timozolomide. I, 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 I thought. I think you meant uh, statins and, and timozolomide. I never thought about this. That's a good question. But there has been clinical studies in which they used uh, timozolomide in combination with uh, with simvastatin for uh, specifically for uh, glioblastoma. <laughs> And they haven't reported any interaction between the drugs, but I need to look into it. Have you published a paper about integrated mathematical and in vitro models for drug screening in tumors? It's under review. The awesome. first paper is under review. Uh, PEG plus ligands help get drugs across BBB. Are you working on this? No, but I would love to work on this. If, if you would like, we can, we can collaborate. I see. I'm going to go to the chat box. There's many questions that came in. Um, would you consider using your mathematical model for examining the development of, of other type of organoid models? For example, for the biliary organoids that are derived from liver cancer uh, patients. Uh, it is possible. Uh, we are collaborating with, uh, with a colleague at BC Cancer Agency to model uh, the uh, ovarian cancer growth and uh, uh, investigate the interaction between the ovarian cancer uh, cells and uh, uh, CAR T cells, but this is an ongoing investigation. Uh, but in terms of other organisms, uh, for sure, we can do that. Uh, we need to receive more funding and we need to have more students like Maytham to do that. Um, why are spheroids so attractive for drug screening? Are those more similar to in vivo cases or just more convenient? Uh, they are. Uh, well, I mean, it depends what you comparing them uh, to, right? I mean, I mean, uh, using uh, spheroids, or we, uh, we recently call them tumoroids, is uh, it enables us to create multicellular, uh, you know, organisms or multicellular tumoroids uh, that uh, mimics the uh, 
the heterogeneity that you usually see in uh, in uh, in the brain tumor and on other types of cancers. Again, we are not the only ones who are using these tumors. And uh, and then the other benefit that tumors using tumors offer is that. Uh, uh, they mimic the uh, the diffusion barriers that usually you typically see uh, in in, in, uh, in native tumors as compared to uh, uh, 2D uh, models or even you know when you grow cells uh, disperse cells in in a gel um, and and then there are also interactions cell cell interactions uh, which you can't see uh, in in um, uh, when when you encapsulate the cell when you just mix the cells in in a gel. Uh, uh, and, and these cell-cell interactions have a significant uh, effect on, on the tumor growth, and the response of the tumor to the uh, to the drugs, and then also uh, the invasion of cells into the neighboring uh, tissues. Um, heterogeneity is a major characteristic of GBM and has to be taken into account for developing new drugs. How would you propose to integrate that component into your GBM on a chip model? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I think in one of the slides that I mentioned, uh, that uh, the very first slides, uh, uh, I talked about two more uh, heterogeneity, uh, which is, uh, is very important in, uh, in glioblastoma and again in other cancer cells. Uh, so our goal is to combine different populations of the cells. That's, that's the first and easy approach is to use just cell lines and then mix them and then form tumoroids. Uh, and then and, and the mixture of the cells will be uh, the cells that have maybe like methylated and um, unmethylated, for example, cells. Uh, and uh, the other one is about the best way and the most, uh, uh, you know, realistic approach uh, or effective approach is to use patient-derived cells. So if, if uh, uh, we're trying to get access to patient-derived cells, we have some patient-derived cells, uh, but we need to have, uh, if we get access to these patient drive cells, then we have all these, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, heterogeneous population of the cells that we can form tumoroids. And then, and then this can uh, some, uh, to some extent uh, address uh, the heterogeneity that we observe in the, uh, in the native tissue. But again, uh, uh, you, you probably know that better than me that when you isolate the cells, we touch their phenotype, so that's one issue. We change their. We may change their phenotype during the isolation process, and then we may change the, uh, uh, you know, their function and behavior later on when we grow them. And we, well, that's another challenge. Excellent. Why you choose cholesterol observation for metabolism TMZ resistant cells? Uh, well, the reason is that we are using uh, statin. And then uh, statin has effect on the cholesterol pathway. And for that reason, we wanted to see whether, uh, how this cholesterol pathway or uh, cholesterol uh, biosynthesis is being affected during the, uh, in, uh, uh, in chemozolomide resistance cells as compared to normal cells. Again, this, this was a pilot study that we performed. And then there is more uh, uh, to come in the, in the in near future. Well, Monsen, thank you for the presentation and having all the you know, questions that uh, people propose. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you for listening to my talk. Have a nice day. Have a thank nice you. day. Thanks.